Welcome to the world according to Mike Graham. The world according to Mike Graham has been a bit quiet lately because Mike Graham, that would be me, uh, hasn't been here. But I'm back now, so the world according to Mike Graham can resume and you can expect a full show full of all the things you love. Uh, we'll have, of course, Trump's takedown. We'll have Prime Minister for a week, but we'll also have my deep dive starting off into Newsnight. <laughs> The BBC launched Newsnight in January 1980, and since then, it's taken on political leaders, embarrassed the odd royal, and been accused of a lack of impartiality, usually by me. But with rumoured budget cuts of £5 million next month, falling ratings and editor who's dramatically quit, is this the beginning of the end for the BBC's flagship news show? Where else can you see Russell Brand share these pearls of wisdom? Is it true you don't even vote? Yeah, no, I don't vote. Well, how do you have any authority to talk about politics then? Well, I don't uh, get my authority from this pre-existing paradigm which is quite narrow and only serves a few people. I look elsewhere for alternatives that might be of service to humanity. And who could forget when Jeremy Paxman asked Michael Howard the same question 12 times? Did you I did not to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten to I overrule him, Mr Howard? I scrupulously in accordance with that advice. I did not overrule Derek Lewis. Did you Lewis. threaten to overrule him? Mr Marriott him? was not suspended. Did you right? threaten to overrule him? It's you, a quite you can straight put, yes you can or put no. the question and I will, I will give, yes you, no I will give you an did answer. Did you threaten to overrule him? Remember when Alistair Campbell embarrassed himself in front of the whole nation? We're going down a rabbit hole, and this is a pointless well, debate. Because you all talk so as rubbish when you come on these programs. Excuse me, that's just unnecessarily rude. But I don't it's think true. Be so I'm sorry. Arrogant. But you can always rely on Alistair to make things much, much worse. You never challenge them. You let them talk Please. utter rubbish about Brexit. And it's happened on the BBC for year after year after year. OK, I, I am not going to take that from you. And who could forget when Prince Andrew revealed his passion for Pizza Express? Going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. Times are changing though at the BBC. Could Newsnight be first for the chop? Let's find out from a Fleet Street veteran. Uh, here's the one and only Nigel Pauly. Nigel, uh, very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, Mike. Thank um, you. For very yeah, kind. Yeah, listen, the, the question is, with a Newsnight, it would seem, I mean, the BBC have got to make cuts. Newsnight has been under fire for an awfully long time uh, for its sort of political bias. They've had several um, defections, uh, which we won't really mention over the course of the last year or so. Um, can they survive? The, the, the ratings for, for Newsnight are abysmal. It was, must be one of the only television programmes during COVID that lost viewers. Yes. Because, like, remember that time we were all trapped in our houses, couldn't do anything, we watched television and streaming services. It lost a load of viewers. It's, it's below 300,000 viewers now. Mm. Like The Guardian doesn't tell its ratings. The BBC is so low there. The, the, the problem it has, it's 43 years old, and the last big investigation it's famous for is one it couldn't screen, mm. not showing the, its own investigation into Jimmy Savile, and that right. was like 10 years ago. They're talking about cutting the budget of it by £5 million to £3 million. I, I find it staggering. They spent £8 million on budget for Newsnight, to be fair. Yeah. It's a studio, presenter. Uh, they've got eight reporters, apparently. Yeah. They, they've, they're talking about cutting investigations. Well, the whole point of Newsnight is to have some sort of investigation. If they just have interviews, they might as well have a podcast. There are a load of good podcasts. You do one. Yeah. You can do a podcast for two and sixpence. Well, you can. You know, but I think it's, 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 it's a bit like sort of they've got this kind of Stockholm syndrome at the BBC, though, haven't they? Because you and I will both know plenty of people who've worked there. Um, and the way that it's run is unlike any other broadcasting organisation in the world, probably, because nobody else has a, the limitless resources they've got. In no other place that I know can you actually say, how much does that cost? And then somebody else goes, oh, don't worry about that. You know, in no world that, that anybody lives in commercial broadcasting, could they get away with it? Television, especially the BBC, have this lofty view that everything they do is worthy. But, I mean, it's three or four years, four years to, since Emily Maitlis uh, interviewed Prince Andrew. Mm. And to be honest, that interview was famous because Prince Andrew showed himself up to, to be a buffoon. Right. It wasn't particularly the skills of the interviewer. She, she won a couple of awards for it and fair play to her. She asked the questions, but most of the, that interview was about Prince Andrew right. dropping himself but in. But also, the, in, the interview itself was set up by somebody else. It was her set-up producer, yeah. and she took all the glory. Right, and you who, know, who, so then left in, who then left 
very unhappily, if you yeah. remember those. She wrote about well, Sam McAllister was her name, yeah. And she, she's now off making uh, a series with Netflix with uh, with some success, it would seem. But, I mean, as far as the whole news division goes, they've got the same problem, haven't they? They've got so many people that pop up on TV and you go, I've never seen him before. Oh, he's, the, he's yeah. yet another Washington correspondent. You go, really? Where did he come from? Well, I mean, the, the, the editor of Newsnight, which used to normally sort of you you spend a few years at the Guardian, a bit in BBC News, and then you go over. Like Ian Katz was an editor about three editors ago. It, it seems strange that the editor of Newsnight, if it's such a prestigious program, should leave to go to Nairobi to be sort of like the head of African services yeah. for BBC World. Yeah. I mean, how is that more prestigious than allegedly um, running Newsnight? So that would suggest. Just how far yeah. Newsnight has fallen. Yeah, I think a bit so. Like BBC I th question time. Yeah, I think BBC so. Question question, time. Well, question time is now a sort of a popular joke in my neck of the woods, and nobody really watches it. All the people that used to watch it now don't bother. And I watched one I, I, relatively recently. It was awful. I was shocked by how bad it was. Yeah, you used to have people like Kenneth Clark, Michael Hazeltine, mm. Michael Foot, big. Beast, right. yeah. whatever. Now, listen, it was Robert. absolutely horrendous. You're absolutely right. Nigel, listen, I've got to call a halt to it there. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, BBC, literally on its last legs, it seems to me. Uh, this is, of course, my deep dive. We'll have more coming up. Now it's time for Apology of the Week. Do you know... When you have an idea and you think it's a good one, well, I've had lots of those, and some of them have turned out to be good, and some of them have turned out not to be so good. So here's my apology for this week. I want to apologise for Kevin O'Sullivan. Kevin O'Sullivan's an old mate of mine. Uh, we've known each other for many, many years, probably more decades than I'd care to remember. I met him first uh, in a bar in Los Angeles. But the trouble is, I made the mistake of thinking that if I gave Kevin O'Sullivan the chance to cover my show, that would be all that would happen. But that wasn't all that would happen, because it turned out not only did he cover my show, he covered all my other shows as well. And then he covered other people's shows. And in fact, I think it was only last week that he was on practically the entire night on Friday. So I'm very, very sorry about that. But I'm not sorry to have Kevin O'Sullivan as a mate, because he is a good one. Politics is a serious business, of course, unless you're Donald Trump, the former president. Let's see what he's been up to with Trump's takedown. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. Wow. So failing Forbes magazine is controlled by communist China. No wonder they go after me and out of their way to write really badly about me and work with the corrupt and incompetent racist attorney general of New York State, Peekaboo James, could never figure out why they just keep writing bad about Trump. No matter how good I'm doing, they write bad. They're really bad news. It's a terrible group of people, some horrible writers. They have really horrible and very untalented writers. But again, after me for years, and now finally I find out why. Because it's owned and operated by China. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. That's all for part one. Coming up after the break, it's Prime Minister for a week. Big opinions. You can't be concerned about these people coming because that makes you a nasty racist. Big guests and the big issues of the day. Join me, Julia Hartley Brewer, every day at 1 p.m. when I'll be tackling the stories that affect real people's lives. These people were effectively, you know, tried and convicted by the court of public opinion. When did we stop the presumption of innocence? Talk TV. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Welcome back to The World According to Mike Graham. Now, it's time for Prime Minister for a week. We've got two brilliant contenders here. We've got uh, Alex Armstrong, we've got Brendan Chilton. Brendan, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, let's see what you would do if you were going to be uh, Prime Minister for a week. 
So, the first thing I would do, Mike, number one, is I would cut corporation tax. Excellent. It's far too high. I'd take it back down to what it was and then I'd gradually bring it down to about 15%. Yeah. I think that would boost investment in this country. It would create more jobs because business would have more money to spend yeah. to create employment and it would get our economy moving, which is what we need. But people are kind of confused now, aren't they? Because I don't really know for sure exactly what corporation tax currently is. They said they were going to do 25% and then Liz Truss said she wasn't going to do 25%. So where are we it's now? It's gone up. It's 24 but we need to get it back down because at the moment we're losing out to Ireland we saw last year mm. Pfizer went over there and set up a factory instead of picking this country yeah. you're not going to get people investing nowadays we're in a global marketplace you look around the world and if you can go right I can have more money uh, setting up my business in that country than that country yeah. they'll go there so we need to attract them here mm. by cutting our corporation tax yeah. rates yeah, we've sort of tended to this low growth economy, haven't we? The highest right. tax burden since World Ridiculous. War II. It's madness, I isn't know. it? How, why would anyone want I to come so. here? Every, every time I hear some commentator talking to a member of the government, the government minister always says, well, the thing is, if we have to do any more, uh, we'd have to put taxes up. And you go, sorry? What? <laughs> to why? where? For what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are we getting? already up. And what are we getting uh, for the taxes we're actually paying at the moment? And so, if you're a company, what are you getting? Well, someone just told me today that the bridges across London are actually owned by charity, run by charities, not by... Are they? <laughs> apparently so. Apparently <laughs> so. That why the millennium bridges falling apart yeah, after exactly, being up for yeah. about 15 years. Where do our taxes even go these days? I don't know where they go. No, Wait. I don't know where they go. Uh, all right, Alex, what's your first one? My first one is, right, get these people doing something useful, send the Just Stop Oil activists to China. Good idea. Right? They, they come on a slow boat, preferably. <laughs> on a very <laughs> slow, oil-powered boat yes. to China, where they can actually do some good. Now, that's, that's, that's the country that really needs to focus on its carbon emissions. We, I mean, we're doing extremely well on that side of things. Yeah. Not that I'm a big propul uh, in favour of, of doing much more on the climate. Right. We've done plenty as it is. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, send them off there, in my opinion. Get Greta on the first ship over there. Well, she's she's only just been here, hasn't she? She's been um, arrested being associated with some other free fossil group or something like that. Apparently, we're told she's now moved to Dorset. I don't know why she decided to <laughs> here because she <laughs> likes it better than she does in Sweden. Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, this is the thing, isn't it? You, you just you just can't make it up. She's everywhere. I mean, how is she getting to these places so quickly? Well, I, only, I think she's at least taken a car. I only knew on she trip. got here because she got arrested. I didn't know she was no. here until she got arrested. Exactly. So As a result of her being <laughs> arrested, she apparently gave an address somewhere in Dorset as to her, um, her, really? her, her home place. I mean, God knows. But I mean, when are they ever going to stop these idiots? Because, yeah. I mean, what they can't do... I mean, the only thing they've managed to influence so far is, is Rishi Sunak announcing new uh, exploration of the North Sea for oil and gas. <laughs> Great. It's not exactly a winning If they ticket. carry on, we might get to frack. Yeah, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe we actually should keep them here. But, I mean, the thing is, it's really irritating. We know, for example, I think, that come the end of this month, they're going to start some new campaign. Oh, um, really? This is going to have new tactics, so they're not going to climb the Dartford crossing, but I presume they're going to do something equally stupid. Yeah. I, but, I mean, you have to wonder about these people that you see on CV weeping and wailing and talking about, it's an emergency, don't you want to save your children? And well, I'm you like, had, no, had that there bizarre an emergency. There isn't. There was that bizarre video from that trans activist as well. I don't know if you saw that the other week. He was talking about trans people fighting for the last loaf of bread in Tesco's. Really? Over, yeah, it was absolutely bizarre. There are much better places to get bread than Tesco's. If I'm going to fight over the last loaf of bread, it's going to be probably in a, an artisan bakery. Of course. <laughs> you know, Overpriced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah. Right, Brendan, your second one? So my second one, again, I am a big proponent of manufacturing. Yeah. I think we need an industrial strategy to get this country making things yes. again. We can sell them abroad, bring in the revenue and drive the yeah. Growth, this is a very, very controversial view, of course, because all we've been making so far over recent times is sort of financial instruments, right? Exactly. So we've become the financial centre of the world, but we're not making anything at all. But let me tell you, in manufacturing, the average job is pays much higher than in the service industry. Yeah. They also create strong communities. Of course, there's massive infrastructure mm. spend that comes along with it. If you really want to level up in this country, you'd have a government that put their focus on revitalising manufacturing. Yeah. But what could we be making that we're not making, for example? Well, at the moment, there's a load... Obviously, we're very good at high specialist things, like weapons and yeah. computers and stuff like that. But there's also low, low, low level manufacturing mm. stuff. Cookers, ironing boards, yeah. toasters, kettles, right. all the stuff that we currently import into this country. Mm. Why aren't we making it? Yeah. Yeah. Sell it at much higher quality around the world and make a good buck. Yeah. Why don't we do it? Well, Sounds you get, like a good idea. Yeah, but, you, I mean, you, the, the problem with this, if we do nationalise it, as we've spoken about, Brenda, is unions. You know, as soon as they get involved, I mean, you, you'll start having supply chain shortages because they're up in arms about the next thing, aren't they? And this is the only problem with, with national 
revitalizing things generally. I mean, I would love to see a revitalization of manufacturing in this country. I think it's desperately needed. Well, I, bring it back from China, bring it back mm. from India. Let's give, let's give our people something to show for. Exactly. Why are ourselves? we spending money on goods made in China, a country that yeah. isn't our friend? Right. Well, because they're cheaper, I think, is a straight answer, isn't it? Well, it is. Try to make the things here, they become more expensive. But coming back to my earlier policy, Mm. see what I did there, just to promote the second one? If we have a lower tax environment and a lower regulatory environment, businesses and investors will come into manufacturing. Yeah, I think that's Mm. not an unfair assessment. Uh, Alex, you want to bring back national service? I do, I do. Law and order. For everyone? Not for us. (laughs) (laughs) Well, 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 look, I think think young people up to the age of 18, this is a must-have for for the next government. Look, law and order on the streets is is madness in the way, and they are, it's mostly young people committing a lot of crime, stealing. You've seen the looting in London lately. It's becoming quite an unsafe place to be. It's not just in London either, it's everywhere. No, it's not. You know, and frankly, I think a lot of it is just... Young people don't appreciate the, what this country does mm. for them. So put them out into public service. Let them actually contribute to society. Yeah. And then they might think twice about you know, looting hardworking businesses. And how long would you put them in for? Uh, two, year? year, two years. Two, two years. years? Yeah, okay. two years. And really proper service, home. like actual, you know, go and work and live yep. in a, some kind of a, some kind of a, a sort of barracks type scenario? Yeah, if we have to. If we have to do it, yeah, absolutely. Get them out in every public service from the defence, mm. uh, policing, yeah. ambulance services. Policing could be good, couldn't it? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, it, it will certainly give them something to do, at least. I mean, yeah. I think the only problem with... Oh, I, I support this sort of initiative, but Cameron tried it, didn't he? Yeah. Remember, a big society, the volunteering uh, aspect. I don't know what happened Yeah, but volunteering is not the same as being told you've got to do exactly. it, Exactly. Yeah. I, I think we need to do it, but I'll tell you what I'd like as well. I'd like governments to say to young people, I'll tell you what, forget sitting in subjects that aren't important, like, yes. you know, humanities and all the rest of it. Why don't we let them set up a business right. when they're in school? Oh, Take one or two this? days out. How about if you go to university for three years, you have to do at least one of those years as part of a national service? I mean, I actually yeah. went to university with a guy who had gone in through the Navy and had qualified as an electrical engineer, but had been put through uni by the Navy. So mm. when he was, while he was at college, if you like, he would have to go off and do, you know, sort of exercises in the Middle yeah. East and stuff like that. You know, while he was while he was well, a student, you do stuff like that. Well, the first year of uni doesn't really count, does it? It's basically a repeat of your A levels. Yeah. So that first year, good idea. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of countries do do this. I think Norway does it yeah. quite famously. Israel, of course, as yeah. well. You know, this is a good thing. It seems to bring a lot of the people. Give well, them it some also respect, might give them some pride back in Britain. Yeah. Mm. Which people yeah. seem to be sadly lacking in at the moment. Massively. Don't they? Brendan, your third one. I would have GB Homes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't see GB your GB Homes. GB Homes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was <laughs> For me to react to that. Sailing close to the light. <laughs> no, no worries. I would have a national home building company. We cannot rely on developers to do yeah. it because they're not doing it. No. We cannot rely on local councils to do it. I'd have a government backed national home building agency that said, tell you what, local uh, NIMBYs, forget you lot. We yeah. need homes and we're going to build them. And if they need to be built on the green belt, if they need to be built in towns, if we need to go up on top of apartment buildings, do it. Cut through all the red tape because this country's got a housing crisis and that in itself, the creation of these new homes will create millions of new jobs. But the trouble with this, it sounds a bit like Keir Starmer's idea for a a nationalised energy company. Well, I think at the moment... UK Energy. No, no, on some things, I think where you can't rely on the private sector to do it, government's job's to step in and give it a go. Uh, And if it's run like a business, but not there to create jobs for people... The reason this is not working at the moment is because the business of home building is not run very well like a business. But this is the problem. How are you going to improve that? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is cut through all the red tape. There are an enormous... There's one thing Keir Starmer said... And I agreed with him. The regulation around home building and planning is ridiculous. Mm. At the moment, across England, there are 90 local authorities that haven't got local plans for development. Why? Because of leftover legislation from the EU on nitrate mitigation newts and swamps. So what we need to do... Why are we still (laughs) still there? It's still there. So cut through all that and get Britain building. Get Britain building. Alex, this is a question that I quite often ask and nobody seemingly can answer it. Why are we still adhering to all of these ludicrous EU rules and regulations that we were supposed to have ditched you know, what, three years ago now? Yeah. Practically? Yeah, I, I, I honestly think it's a lack of, if I may say this word on TV, balls yeah. by the you Tory can. government. You say on this show. <laughs> Great. Up good. 11 yeah. at night. <laughs> <laughs> balls from the yeah. Tory government. And they, and this is it. They, you've seen Rishi get quite close to the European Union over the last yeah. few years, and he seems to be making a lot of concessions. Seem, they, they seem to quite like Rishi, which is surprising yeah. for a post-Brexit Britain. They should be trying to do everything they can to take us down. But but I think they are scared of the, what the European Union will do backwards, yeah. and obviously they, they want to 
to come to some agreement over immigration, which is where I think all yeah. these concessions are which happening. Which brings you to your final um, it does. suggestion very nicely. Yes. Final solution yeah. here, guys. <laughs> right. Not not that kind of final solution. <laughs> Let's be very clear. Let's be very, very clear about you that. You shouldn't be unable to say those two words. <laughs> no, you again. shouldn't. You shouldn't. But somehow people go, oh, blimey. <laughs> well, you'll know someone will take it out of context yeah. and mix it up with some yeah, other yeah. things that I've said on TV before. But, but, but my solution to the rubber dinghy issue would be this build a seawall mm. in the English Channel. Trump's done it to great success in America. Let's find, let's Has figure he? out. Well, well, he was. Last time I he saw, was. last time I looked, there was about a million people coming across the well, border. Well, that's, that's the Biden, the Biden well, administration. Well. They've just started rebuilding that wall, by the way. Yeah. They've just started building more of mm. it because they realized they've made a massive error in mm. stopping it in the first place. But what, what other options have we got? Put a wall around Britain. How easy is it going to be to put a wall in the sea, though? <laughs> I think it'll be a nightmare, but I, mean, I think it'll be quite difficult. I think it's yeah. sort of more like sort of, it's a knockout style, a movable. <laughs> <laughs> If you can get past the obstacles. No, just get a of <laughs> Behind this door, Boris yeah. Johnson. You have to get up out of the boat. And a big sort of hammer comes around. If you can avoid that, you can get onto the next stage. I think, I think make it more of an obstacle course. A gladiator course, yeah. I love yeah. that. I mean, but, I mean uh, that could be a lot easier. You, you know, maybe a more sensible policy on top of my crazy idea of building a sea wall would be to yeah. send them to Ascension Island. You know, this is an island we control. We wouldn't have all the yeah. jurisdiction of the ECHR. We could get around that pretty quickly, yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Fulton Islands you could use as well. Absolutely. Well, listen, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, I've known Brendan much longer than I've known you, and I'm loath to say it, but I'm going to give it to him, Brendan. Because, Stop the vote. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, I like the, national, I like the national service. I like the just stop all to China. I quite like the idea, not so much of a seawall, but definitely the obstacle course. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's a, it's a, it's a channel knockout or on something the, like on that. On the obstacle you know. course basis, I concede. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I okay. But listen, thank you to both of you. Yeah. Very, very kind. Um, we'll see you again very soon here on Talk TV. So, um, Alex has won, uh, and that was Prime Minister for the week. And now, why is this still a thing? Have you tried to make a phone call this week or have you tried to get through to anybody this week? I don't mean your friends, I don't mean people that you would actually ring up for a chat. I'm talking about organisations, you know, like when you have to call the bank to say, why have you bounced that particular payment? Or why have my money uh, not been put in the right place? Or, you know, why are you screwing me so well on the old interest rates? Well, what about when you're trying to call somebody who's going to deliver something to you? That's even worse. You get put into this hell of a waiting game. And they say, oh, your call is important to us. Uh, you are number 5,325 on the list. We'll get to you very soon, as soon as we can. Why are they still doing it? Why don't they just do what most intelligent organisations do, which is to say, if you want to be called back, hit this button here, and then they just call you back. So you don't have to sit waiting for hours and hours on end. I know someone this week who was on hold for two hours trying to talk to their insurance company. Don't do it. Why is it still a thing? <laughs> So that was the world according to Mike Graham. Back in the saddle, back for another week. I'll see you next time, right here on The World According to Mike Graham.